Good evening. I am Assemblywoman Kari Petrie Norris, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Facebook Live Town Hall. We'll be focused on talking about uh, mental health in the time of COVID-19. I'm pleased to be joined this evening by my co-host, Congressman Harley Ruda. Thank you so much for being here. And we're also joined this evening by uh, Dr. Carrie Ingleton, who is the president of the Orange County Psychological Association, and by Dr. Carol Agar, who is the past president of the Orange County Psychological Association. Thank you both for being here. As I said to you, before we turn the cameras on, uh, we have been getting so many questions and people are really looking forward to, I think this opportunity to uh, have some perspective, um, be connected with practical resources and understand what we can do to navigate this turbulent time. I think to say that we are living through stressful times is the understatement of the century. People are grappling with stressors that are both immediate and practical. I just lost my job. I don't know how to homeschool my kids. I'm watching my retirement, my savings evaporate, and stressors that are, are existential as we navigate this unprecedented global public health crisis. There are so many unknowns, uh, and it's, it's not surprising that uh, we're seeing an unprecedented uh, demand for mental health resources, and sadly, we are seeing suicide rates spike alongside this pandemic. So I want to thank our experts for, for joining us this evening. And I want to thank my co-host, Congressman Harley Bruda, for your leadership and your continued partnership. Um, I'd love to, to hand it over to you for, for your opening remarks before we get, uh, get to the questions. Thank you, Assemblywoman Petrie Norris. And thank you for your leadership, not just on this topic, but so many other uh, issues that are important to your constituents here. Uh, you've done a fabulous job. Of, of, of making sure that they have access to the information, the facts, and the resources they need to uh, do the best they can to manage through this pandemic. Uh, we've had numerous of these uh, town halls uh, often together. In fact, just last week, I did a couple town halls, one on uh, the, the concerns regarding uh, domestic violence and child abuse as we are in these stressful times, as well as food, food security. Uh, as we have seen the pictures on TV, the number of people who are having to reach out to food banks just to be able to feed their families. All of this is adding to the incredible stress that uh, working families around the country, our senior citizens, uh, they're dealing with issues that none of us really ever uh, comprehended that we would have to face. And you know, let me share some statistics with you just here in Orange County. Uh, one in five people in Orange County have reported needing help with behavioral health issues. About 10% of adults in Orange County report likely serious, seriously psychological distress, and we've been seeing that increase uh, over the years. This is before COVID-19, and unfortunately, the crisis is causing mental health concerns to grow even more. Uh, in April, about 20,000 people texted a federal emergency hotline for people in emotional distress. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's a thousand percent increase versus last year. We know as we continue to navigate these waters that uh, mental health is gonna become an even bigger issue. Uh, for obviously, we have the reasons associated with uh, stay at home orders, having our lives disrupted, people losing their job, concerns about losing their businesses. You also have on top of that, uh, people who are dying. Uh, they're dying without their loved ones at their side. And those loved ones have to march on without having an opportunity to, to say a proper goodbye, let alone having their world turned upside down by having a loved one die unexpectedly. So we know that the mental health issues facing us uh, now and in the months and years to come have been deeply exasperated by uh, the pandemic. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be on with Cadi to be able to uh, host these doctors and, and uh, their expertise with you so you can understand the challenges that all of us and our loved ones are facing. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Agar, would you go ahead and, and introduce yourself to the folks at home and uh, share your opening remarks? Um, my name is Dr. Agar. I have a practice in Irvine. Um, my, my specialty is in clinical neuropsychology. 
Um, so I do a lot of testing um, with children as well as older adults. Um, and I also do therapy as well. Um, but I see a lot of um, tension during this time, especially because um, if, if patients have been waiting to get testing done and during this time they can't because they can't come into the office, um, those have been challenges. But, you know, we have been working um, in terms of following the guidelines to make sure that we're following all the safety protocols and also to make sure that we're providing services to the community. Thank you. And Dr. Inkleton. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I am, a, a, I practice independently in Newport Beach, so I'm uh, local here. Um, one of my expertise areas is trauma, and I also work with Gottman Methods Couples Therapy, uh, which is really handy right now. Um, a lot of people are having uh, trouble uh, working with their, you know, their spouses at the moment. Um, I've noticed there have been a lot of changes in health, in mental health field, uh, just regarding using telehealth as the big format. Um, right now, everyone's doing um, video therapy, and it's been a challenge for some clients to really adjust. And um, I'm hoping that after all this uh, is over with, we're going to all feel a little bit more comfortable with all kinds of different uh, communication forms and, and uh, technology, even if we weren't really wanting to do that before, maybe now we will. So I think it could be good. Right. It definitely is. I think we all use this phrase now. It's, it is certainly a new normal. Um, and I think we're all having to, to try to find ways to, to connect uh, you know, through technology. And I think we're, we're all lucky that, uh, that we're living in a moment where that is possible. But it certainly it is not without its challenges. And it's been a tough transition for so many of us. Um, so uh, Dr. Ingleton, I want to come back to you with, with our first question. So um, as we know, COVID-19 has challenged, has challenged our, our resources, our expectations in so many ways. Um, kind of taking the big picture, what, what are the key issues that you see arising right now uh, with mental health? You know, I'm seeing a lot of people are experiencing a lot of anxiety and stress. Um, they're also feeling lonely and uh, kind of forced to stay in their, in their small, uh, you know, their homes or their, their small um, environments uh, without being able to go to some of their normal places where they cope. Um, a lot of people are feeling sad as well, uh, either because they're isolated or because uh, their employment situation has changed, um, different things like that. Um, there are a lot of people who are um, dealing with marital uh, problems and also behavioral problems with their children, um, just because everyone's feeling very stressed, their schedules are different, and children are going to act out a little and people are going to get maybe a little irritated just um, from being confined. Uh, I am also seeing a lot of the other side. I'm seeing people being amazingly flexible. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people reaching out for support, helping each other, and also the community coming together. And it makes me very hopeful um, that as a community, uh, as, as horrible as this is, it might remind us uh, who we are and what we are capable of. So hopefully, uh, one, of my, one of my messages here is I'd like to make sure everyone realizes that it's normal to feel this stressful, this stressed right now. It's normal and it's okay to rely on other people. So just know you're not alone and there are a lot of people out there who would like to be uh, there for you. Great, we'll move on to question number two. Dr. Agar, this is for you. Uh, we talked about this at the very beginning about how stressful this time frame is uh, and we can obviously see that continuing for months and years as we navigate these troubling waters. Uh, what ideas uh, would you suggest for individuals to manage that stress, process that stress uh, as they deal with it in their individual ways as well as among their families? You're right. These are very challenging and unprecedented times. And, you know, it's a very difficult time and situation. And even if individuals had ways to kind of cope with their stress and anxiety before, now they might have to do those things in a different way. You know, if, if people manage their stress by going outside, going to the beach, or 
going to the restaurant, going to the movies. Well, we can't do that now. Um, so people have had to be creative in terms of how to kind of manage their stress in different ways. And so I've kind of, um, you know, talked with different individuals and kind of thought about, well, what are some of the things that you can do? Because when you're feeling like you don't have control, that creates more stress. So think about what is in your control. How can you manage your environment? What can you do about it? If you like to exercise, um, what about uh, joining the live exercise sessions that you can find on YouTube or on the internet, something like that? Um, or catching up on a skill that you always wanted to do, learning a new language, whatever it is, there's a lot of resources out there too. Um, and then also trying to do other things. You know, I've seen a lot of people doing a lot of fixing up on their home, doing a lot of hands-on project, um, using your hands, you know, doing those things also, you know, will help to relieve stress as well. So it's just trying to be a little bit creative in terms of how to manage our stress in this time. Yeah, gotcha. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, Dr. Inkleden, I actually wanted to reach out to you and ask you the same question with a slight twist to it, and that is, we've got Mother's Day coming up on this Sunday, and uh, mothers who, uh, in addition to playing many traditional roles, are now playing additional roles, including uh, being one of the chief providers of education and homework management and uh, meal preparation and so much more on their plates while they are still trying to do uh, their other work that they've, they've done, including uh, out there working. And how do they juggle all of this now? Any tips for them? Because the stress level for them, as well as the fathers, has certainly increased dramatically. Absolutely. I think this, uh, I have some tips for moms, but I think they really apply to a lot of people. But if moms could remember this weekend that they need to make sure that they're taking care of themselves and other people are taking care of them as well. Uh, a lot of times women uh, report to me that they feel like they spend their lives taking care of other people and ignoring their own needs. So self-care is a priority, making sure that they're getting enough sleep and they're working on their own nutrition, not just worrying about their children um, and exercises we talked about. Um, even uh, something as simple as bathing daily, because people are staying home, bathing daily can help people feel a little bit more clean in our you know, environment right now where we're feeling especially uh, you know, worried about germs. Um, staying connected with social support, um, even scheduling time for the, for, you know, for yourself, schedule some time for yourself. If it's hard to do that because of sharing children, um, one of the best things to do is, is schedule some time for each, each partner. Uh, you have this day and I have that day. Um, get a, have a day off. Um, limiting exposure to social media and, and other sources of stress could be a good one. And then just maybe going online and taking a relaxation class or um, learning a new skill like breathing, reaching out to a professional therapist or joining a support group. Those can all really help moms uh, in general and uh, this weekend, hopefully too. Thank you. Well, and I think it's, it's so important, I think, for, for us to remember as moms, well, and also as dads, but, you know, I think as we approach Mother's Day, as moms, it's, it's the, you know, the saying, you've got to make sure that you put on your own oxygen mask first, mm -hmm. right? It's like, That's we've right. got to make sure we're taking care of ourselves. So we take care of our kids and our parents and, and all the other people, you know, our husbands, our wives, all the other people that we care about so much. Um, so kind of speaking of, speaking of family, um, we have now been sheltering in place for almost two months and uh, we've got family units, large, small, sort of mixed families. We're spending a lot of time together under one roof. And that, as we all know, you know, even in a perfect family, that can create a lot of stress and a lot of tension. So what are your, what are your top kind of pointers or your top suggestions for families who are starting to, you know, to feel the stress of a little too much togetherness time? Well, you know, what I would say is uh, try, I have about five different suggestions. One of them is learn how to self-soothe, learn how to soothe yourself. So if for you, when you start getting stressed, you need to take a walk, 
know that. Have a list of things that help you to soothe yourself. But also work with your family. Uh, actually sit down and make a list of the way you all soothe each other. You can actually notice the tensions are getting high and, and nicely suggest, how about, you know, how about we go take a walk? Or how about, you know, why don't you do that puzzle you were working on? That can really help. Um, setting up a family schedule for all seven days of the week. Um, is a really good idea. Not a strict schedule that's really detailed, but one in the mornings we do this, in the afternoons we do this, in the evenings we do this. Uh, everyone knows kind of what to expect. That's where you can schedule some alone time. I, I really highly, highly suggest everybody schedule some alone time or some downtime. Um, partners can take turn, turns if they're taking care of young children as well. Um, trying to also make, if people would like to make a list um, of things that they really like, make them feel loved from other family members or people they're living with, and put that on the refrigerator. Each family member can look at the list each day and just pick one of the things off of someone else's list and try to do that for them. That kind of helps to make everyone feel a little bit more positive toward each other. And then um, the last thing I'll say is uh, maybe try some, uh, I appreciate exercise, or maybe you sit down once a week and you have a family meeting, and each person maybe says a couple things that they appreciate about the other family members to again, pull the, pull the family together as a unit and to remind each other to, you know, that they're grateful for each other. And even if there are some tensions that are high, uh, that can actually help to really smooth some things out when you remember that your children actually think that you're okay and your teenagers don't hate you and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I think it's important to be flexible during this time too. You know, you, you, you have to kind of understand that, you know, we, we can't expect things to be done as we normally would. So, you know, uh, a lot of children, they're doing online school and, and, you know, the parents are kind of having to manage the, you know, looking over their assignments and things like that. And, you know, we, ought, we have to be flexible in terms of that. And, you know, we might have to change our expectations a little bit. And that's okay. You know, as long as we're trying to do our best in terms of managing our stress, um, it's okay to, to just adjust to that. So next question, you know, we're talking a lot about how people can cope with the additional stress, but let's, let's take it up a notch in the sense that uh, individuals are, are reaching literally the breaking point. They uh, are trying to stave off the loneliness uh, and, and dealing with emotions and stress levels that they're, they're just not prepared for. They need additional help. What are the next steps? And you know, there's, uh, there's, there's a point where what was outlined earlier, while it's incredibly helpful, may not be enough. So uh, Dr. Agar, starting with you, what would be perhaps a, the next steps for an individual to take? Right, and it's important um, during this time to make sure that you reach out. Um, you know, like we talked about before, you want to make sure that you are staying connected with others. However, a lot of people are depressed during this time. It's difficult to do that. Um, and if they can reach out to professionals, to therapists, most of us are doing telehealth at this time. And so that it would be easier to connect in that way. Um, you will be able to speak with a professional and talk to someone and get the help that you need. Um, and, and, you know, in a lot of ways that this is, this is a good time where we have a lot of resources in, in that, you know, looking at those type of circumstances because sometimes people can't get professional help because they don't, they lack transportation or scheduling issues. Um, so in that way, telehealth is very flexible. Um, there's many organizations and resources where you can find therapists, whether it's um, Psychology Today, the California Psychological Association, um, here in Orange County, the Orange County Psychological Association, you can find therapists and you can uh, reach out to them, whether it's via a telehealth platform, platform such as this, um, or texts. Um, there's many ways to reach out for help, but it's very important to find that professional help. And Dr. Eagleden, what would you add to that? You know, what I, I could add uh, one more thing. A lot of times people during this period are finding that if they talk with other others going through the same experiences, it's been helping. Uh, so maybe finding a group of your friends who you can uh, get some support from, like a support group, or, or joining a professional support group where you're, 
you're finding maybe a women's support group for self-care or um, we do one with the Orange County Psychological Association. It's a self-care check-in for psychologists. Having other people who are in similar situations uh, that you can talk to and kind of they, they get it, they understand, that really goes a long way to saving up the feeling of uh, loneliness and also helping people to feel a little bit more connected and less sad and isolated and stressed. Okay. Thank you. Back to you, Assemblywoman. Well, we have, we actually have a couple of questions that are coming in that are kind of around the same theme uh, related to the stress that people are experiencing because not just of the pandemic itself, but because of this increasingly kind of politicized, polarized view of that pandemic. So we have two questions that I want to read. So there is so much division and nastiness politically. What can we do? Arguing with friends continually, having to talk myself off a ledge. Uh, I'm handling the stay at home, but I find myself getting very angry at people who don't think the pandemic is real, uh, that the numbers of dying don't matter all that much. I do meditation, I exercise. Any other ideas? So I would suggest, um, you know, sometimes we get inundated with information and that causes increased anxiety at times. And we want to make sure that, you know, during this time, we want to make sure we limit the information that we're getting and we want to make sure that we're getting the information um, from credible sources, um, particularly as it relates to, let's say, COVID-19, um, you know, getting information from the CDC. Um, and, and so, because we could get information from all sorts of, of areas and we get inundated and we're not sure, is this real? Is this, is this blown out of proportion? And that causes greater anxiety. So we may have to limit the information that we get for a time being. And also to make sure that, you know, like we talked earlier, um, connecting with other people, going to support groups. There are many support groups online as well. Um, but being able to kind of manage your emotions as well. Um, you know, already we're feeling a lot of stress, economic step stress, financial stress, family stress. Um, and this is kind of at this divisiveness is adding to that as well. So if, you know, if you've tried the different um, coping skills like meditation, exercising, you know, and you, you say, you know what, I'm doing everything. How come I'm still feeling this way? You know, reach out to a professional as well. Because just because sometimes we want to do everything we can, and we, we're going to do this and this and this, and sometimes we have to just stick to a re routine create a routine so we don't feel like we are in chaos and we do have some control over our, our, over our lives. Yeah, you mentioned that there are, you mentioned that there are um, online support groups and online meditation resources. Are there any, is there any specific uh, resource that you would recommend that we can point folks to who are watching at home? I, I have some, uh, Dr. Agar might as well. Um, there's a company that I've been working with, really, they do a really great job of presenting free access, webs, their webinars and um, actual classes and things. Called, it's called accesseliteNow.com. They have, okay. I did a meditation the other day, I woke up and went on there and I was like, oh, a free meditation. They do yoga classes, um, like core building class. They do cooking classes for nutrition. It's really a great wellness site. Also, I recommend to a lot of my clients apps on their phone, such as um, Balance or Headspace or Calm. Uh, there's, there are many, many, many more as well, but having some of those resources, um, so that's helpful. And uh, I also had one more comment about what we talked about earlier, um, normalizing, you know, when people are getting upset uh, because they're fighting with their friends or arguing about what's going on or, or starting to feel a little bit stressed out remembering that we're all going through something right now and uh, giving yourself a break, a little bit of a break. Because a lot of times when we're upset and we're feeling like, why are we fighting? We also start feeling like, what's wrong with me? Like, why am I, I'm not acting like me either. 
So what's wrong? So remembering this is what everyone's experiencing can go a long way. And the other thing is when you hear a friend or someone tell you something that's upsetting to them, like this is never gonna end or this is gonna be bad or whatever, a lot of times if you just listen to what they just said and tell them back what they just said, like it sounds like you're really stressed or it sounds like you know, you're really, you don't think this is ever gonna end. Sometimes that's a way to get around, kind of, um, kind of side sidestep the argument or, um, and not take it personally, really. They might be really just communicating to you how they feel is what I'm trying to say, so. And yeah. Congressman, I would really love your perspective too on, um, you know, this point people are making that kind of the, the polarized and divisive political climate is contributing to the stress people are already experiencing. How do you, how do you cope with that? Yeah, it's unfortunate because the last thing we need is the polarization uh, during a pandemic. And we've, you know, we've gone from working so well collaboratively together, regardless of party affiliation, to address a pandemic. And uh, somehow, you know, the, the lines are now being defined as uh, open everything up or shut everything down when the reality all along has been to slow the spread of the disease uh, so that those that are most vulnerable have the time to have the appropriate protections, that we don't uh, overwhelm our hospitals and, and frontline healthcare workers, and to allow new therapies to come forward to help those who uh, do become infected and are at risk. And we've been doing a great job along those lines. And while I know it's incredibly difficult, I think people need to recognize that uh, one extreme or the other is not going to solve the problem and the best way to solve the problem and get the economy back to not just surviving and thriving is making sure that we work together in a pragmatic rational way and uh, i think i'm not sure which doctor said it earlier but tuning out social media for a while uh, could be really good for your mental health i could not i could not agree more um i think that I, you know, I, I want to be informed. I need to be informed to do this job. But if I read everything and go down every rabbit hole on Twitter or Facebook, I, I end up feeling both incredibly depressed and like totally out of control. So that is, is actually one thing that I have, have been doing is consciously limiting my intake so that I don't let that happen. And I think the other thing I would say to, to people who are feeling angry when they see kind of you know, a, a view that is so counter to theirs being expressed is it is my firm belief kind of back to, to social media that, you know, the, the most active voices on social media, it's like the, the 10% on either extreme. And they may be the loudest voices, but they aren't the majority of voices. And I do think that, I mean, I think it's always important, but I think it's so important for us to remember that particularly in this moment of crisis and this pandemic that we have so much more in common than we do apart. And we, you know, we're, we're not going to get through this if we are divided. And um, I believe that that is what most people want. Um, and unfortunately, I think that there are some people who would seek to kind of exploit a crisis to, to drive people apart, which is devastating. But, you know, if that's causing you stress, I firmly believe, and I think that, you know, the data proves it, that that's not where most people are. Most people want to move forward together. Um, so uh, getting, getting back to, getting back to, to another, another topic, um, again, re related to, to my kids. So we talked a bit about moms. We talked about families. I am the mom of two boys. My boys are, are both in middle school. Um, right now, our children, I mean, at every, at every age, they are going through something that's hard to fathom you know, if you're a small, particularly if you're a small child, but kind of at every age, they are being bombarded with really horrific, a really horrific reality. Um, how do we, how do we talk to our kids about COVID-19? You know, young kids, kids my age and, and our teenagers, how do we help them in this moment? You know, that's a really good question. Children really look to adults for guidance, no matter how old they are. And if the parents seem overly worried or they're not sure, uh, how to manage the situation, the children are gonna feel a little bit more anxious too. So remaining calm is important. And if it's true, also emphasizing that your family is safe and is fine right now. Uh, also that our health officials are helping to keep people safe. Things like that can help uh, 
children to feel a little bit more calm. Uh, also making yourself available to the kids. Uh, any age, children want to talk about how they're feeling when they're going through this kind of situation. So helping them uh, understand what's going on, giving them uh, age appropriate factual information about the situation helps. Um, helping them to kind of have a more healthy perspective maybe and giving them lots of affection. Those are some really great um, ideas. We have, um, there are some resources I believe that are going out um, with the slides. Uh, there's, there are a couple books on there that I recommend to, for younger children. Um, the World Health Organization great. published one called My Hero Is You, and another one is Trinket and Sam. So those are good for talking to kids. That's great. Dr. Agar, is there anything you would add? Um, you know, just uh, to piggyback on what Dr. Engelden said, you know, again, age appropriate information um, and just to give them the facts and just to be calm and just to really listen and just to be supportive. I, I think that could go a long way. Um, you know, just making sure that they, they feel that they're being heard and that you are available to them. And I think that will calm their, their anxiety and their, you know, their fears about what's going on around them. Because especially for little kids, it could be scary to see a lot of people in public wearing masks. I mean, this is, you know, it, it, it would look like if I was a child, I would be very scared. Um, so just ensuring that, you know, they have that information, but, but telling them in an age appropriate way and just giving them the minimal facts that they need. Dr. Ankleton, uh, I'll start with you on this next question. And I want to address in this time of higher stress, more those that are more at risk and specifically talking about those that uh, have had a history of depression or anxiety or have overcome substance abuse and, and the concerns of slipping back. Any uh, advice for those individuals who, again, might have a higher propensity to respond to this stress in a negative way? Absolutely. It's a great question. You know, I, I first, uh, I think everybody needs to remember again that this is normal right now to feel very upset and extra stressed out. Um, many people are reaching for previously used, maybe unhealthy coping mechanisms like, you know, drinking too much or eating too much. Um, so first of all, give yourself a break. You don't have to be so hard on yourself if you make some kind of a mistake, but also be ready to reach out for some extra support, whether it's from a professional therapist or it's, um, you know, somebody in an AA group or a different kind of group. Um, uh, the most important thing I think is building a relapse prevention plan. And you can do that by yourself. If you've had, if, if you've, you've had enough treatment, you should probably already have one, but brain, it basically involves brainstorming clues that typically tell you that you're about to relapse. Like for instance, you start getting cravings if you're a substance user, uh, if, you, if you struggle with substance um, use or abuse or for depression, you just start kind of noticing that you just don't take phone calls and maybe you quit, quit, quit en enjoying your hobbies, things like that. So when you have some clues, it alerts you that I need to do something now. And then the second part of this is having a list of some of the good coping skills and behaviors that you've used in the past that have really been helpful for you. So when you start noticing the clues are happening, you go to the list of the, the, the kind of solution and, um, and you can go ahead and use those. And if you have this in place before you start to decline, that's actually even better, uh, much better. Great advice, Dr. Agar, uh, could you add a, your thoughts as well? Right, um, again, just like what Dr. Inkleden said, um, learning to know, understand and being very attuned to what's going on with yourself and making sure that you catch where you are before it gets worse. So let's say, you know, if you're getting angry and then you start to see that you're like at a level three, you want to make sure you catch that before you get to a five, you know, and then making sure that you are kind of incorporating some of these skills so that you can kind of get back to a state where you feel a little bit calmer. But especially in this time, like Dr. Ingolden said, you know, uh, many people may resort to make resort to things that they used to do that really didn't work out for them like you know resorting to substances and things like that and we want to make sure that you know we are providing the help for those people but again reaching out for support during this time is very very important 
And we actually, we have a quick follow-up on, on that topic. So are there any specific uh, mental health apps that you would recommend for individuals who are struggling with depression or with substance abuse disorders? I think Dr. Eagleden had mentioned some of them before. Um, and, and I think that we, we have provided some links as well. And I Great. think it might be at the end of this presentation. Um, there's a lot of resources out there and there are a lot of apps and depending on what you're going through, um, you know, a, there's a lot of meditation apps. There's a lot of apps that um, help ease your anxiety. Um, one of them is called COVID Coach. Um, there's a lot of different um, apps out there that will kind of help you manage your mood. Using a mood tracker is also very helpful because you want to make sure that you are kind of sticking to a routine. During this time, some people who are lucky enough to be working from home, um, they're working from home, but then they're not in their usual routine. They might be waking up later. They're not changing their clothes. Um, and, but you want to make sure that you stick to a routine as much as possible where you're waking up at the same time every day. You're making sure that you're getting dressed, you're eating, um, and then you set boundaries. Um, because if you don't, then you can kind of slowly get into this, this slump where you don't want to be. And then it's going to be very hard to kind of bounce back from that. If I could just add real quickly, there's an app that I've used before called Mood Kit. Okay. Mood Kit. Um, it mm -hmm. actually has a really great way of doing what Dr. Agar said, tracking your mood, um, helping you to notice what, what you rate yourself on a scale from whatever, one to, to ten, um, so that you're tracking whether you're getting more activated or less. Uh, it has a way of um, telling you, helping, helping you to set some goals for uh, taking care of yourself and helps you to kind of rethink some of the maybe negative thought your thoughts you're having in your head, things like that. It's a really powerful app. It, it's good for anxiety, depression, and a lot of other things. That's great. Thank you. That's a good, that's a, a terrific recommendation. Um, switching text slightly, we, uh, we know that our seniors are particularly at risk uh, from COVID-19 and are particularly vulnerable. Uh, many of our seniors are very scared right now how do we how, how do we have productive conversations with the seniors in our lives about quarantining about taking precautionary steps and about navigating through this moment this is a tough it's a tough one because there's a personal choice or autonomy involved and there's also family you know support involved uh, I think families should maybe work together based on their own family culture uh, and talk and sit down and have a real serious, just a, a real good talk about how they're all feeling. Um, a lot of the elder population I work with, um, they're split. Some of them are feeling like very scared and very worried. And then others are feeling just isolated and they wish they could get out there, but they're not as scared about, you know, getting sick. So uh, I think the family needs to talk. And if they, if the elder, if the elder in their family is, choosing to do something they don't, that the family doesn't agree with, I don't think the family probably in most cases can uh, tell the elder what to do sometimes, but they actually might be able to express how they feel. Um, their, their elder family member might not realize that this, there's stress involved here, um, mm -hmm. you know, with, with what's going on. So I don't know, Dr. Agar, do you have something to add to that? Um, you know, working with the elderly, you know, sometimes, especially during this time, you know, some, some might, might not be techno, no, technologically savvy um, and which could be problemat problematic in a sense when we are trying to use um, these type of platforms to connect with one another. another. So it's really important, um, like, you know, you said, to, you know, utilize family members or if you don't have family members, um, other individuals, neighbors, someone that you, you might be able to reach out to that could kind of help you kind of navigate those, um, like using technology in order to kind of reach out and connect with others as well. 
And if I could add one more thing, I think that there's so much information floating around right now, um, and a lot of it's statistical or, or you know, it's, it speaks to, in general, this is what the situation is. It is not specific to an individual. So one of the best sources of information might be the elder person's um, primary care physician. If that mm -hmm. primary care physician is very worried because they have other risk factors aside from just purely being uh, a certain age, that might be another piece of information that, you know, they maybe feel a little better or a little worse. The family might feel better. We don't know, but it's, it's, it's truth. I think truth is always good with communication, so. Right, absolutely. And we're in this moment, like you said, there is, there are so many unknowns um, and just that alone can be very overwhelming. So the more, the more facts that we can have, whether it's about the situation or about our specific situation, the better it, it positions us to, to move through this. So next question, we've seen in the news an uptick in uh, racism and uh, hate crimes against the AAPI community, uh, Asian Americans being singled out uh, by uh, ignorant individuals who are, are uh, creating uh, angst for them, not just uh, directly through these hate crimes, but also created a, 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 an environment for uh, many of our fellow citizens and residents to uh, feel at risk when they just go out and about. And so my question, I'll start with you, Dr. Agar, for those who actually witness these hate crimes or uh, hate speech, uh, whether they're reading it, seeing it, hearing it, what would you recommend for them who see somebody uh, being abused or for those who are personally uh, uh, feeling the that that personal abuse. That's a great question. Um, you know, it depends on the situation. Obviously, you want to make sure that you are taking safety precautions. Um, you know, and you, trying to see what what type of situation that that you're in and what how much can you get involved. You want to make sure that you know if you can document the event make sure you do that. You know, if you need to utilize that information later and report it to authorities, then that information is, is very important. Um, if you are feeling stressed, you know, if you are feeling stressed from either witnessing or being the victim of, of racism or discrimination, um, then, then definitely you wanna make sure that you do reach out to professionals and or our support groups as well um, because this is a time when, you know, already, you know, we may be in this divisive kind of climate and then this um, COVID-19 has maybe escalated that um, particularly for the Asian community. Um, uh, one of the links that I have provided was with the um, Asian Neuropsychological Association. They have provided a page of different um, links there um, where people can go to to find different resources on managing um, their anxieties. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brayton, would you like to jump in on that as well? Thank you. Apparently I will. <laughs> um, I think one of the, th Dr. Agar's uh, comments were really pertinent. Um, I think one of the things that we can also keep in mind are the way we act reflects uh, it, it models for other people. Uh, so if we can be continuing to learn about other people and learning about other traditions and other cultures, and if we can be having open conversations, if we're worried about something instead of uh, relying on stereotypes, maybe let's, let's just talk about we're all scared. How about we just admit that? Um, we don't really need to worry about blaming so much as um, it's misplaced anyway, but you know, that's, that's one of the things we can do is um, just learn more about people, model good behavior. And then if you find that you come in contact with someone, a friend or anybody who's been uh, a victim of some kind of a hate crime or uh, some of these things that are going on, you know, it's really great to just let them have a chance and tell them that you're there and that you don't think that was right. And maybe let them talk about it. Um, so they know that they have support openly from a lot of people. Yeah, and I agree, and I, and I hope that they can uh, help encourage them to report any acts of violence against them because it's important for uh, law enforcement to understand when and where these hate crimes take place and, and hopefully have an appropriate response. 
it has, it's been, it's been a devastating part of the last several months, really and truly. And I think that somewhat back to the, the conversation we were having earlier, just about the political divisiveness that we're seeing right now. I think that um, sometimes people, people want to be able to scapegoat something, whether that's people that have different political views than you or people that, you know, have different practices than you or, or people that, you know, that aren't you. And the, I think, inconvenient reality of this is that the only enemy here is COVID-19 and uh, it is formidable, but trying to blame other people isn't going to move any of us forward. Um, so let me see. Um, okay. And somewhat related to that, but, you know, just broadly, what can we as a community do, whether that is, you know, in terms of supporting the AAPI community specifically, or even more broadly, what, what can we as a community do to build connectedness and support during this challenging time? Um, well, one thing I can think of is we can all remember and remind each other that we're going through this together. There's no one on the planet who is not struggling with this right now uh, unless they don't know about it. So we're, we're all in this together and humans historically have been a group, you know, we're very gregarious. We live in groups and we rely on uh, altruism, which is taking care of other people and helping, um, helping each other. So I think remembering that that's our mandate right now is to not, not be thinking only of yourself, but thinking of our neighbors and our friends, finding out what we can do. And also just continue to give yourself a break right now. You're, you're str everyone is stressed. Everyone's not acting like themselves. They're feeling more stressed or irritable. I think that will help go a long way to uh, helping everyone to, as a community, get along a little better um, and maybe not be so stressed out. And I think that, you know, um, like piggybacking on what Dr. Ingleden said, um, if you were, if we're doing something outside of ourselves, whether it's, you know, um, volunteering our, our time, um, doing something for someone else, just helping them out or being there just to listen to them, um, that goes a long way. And um, that will also bring us together. But, you know, you might actually feel better, you know, just by doing something for others, and you're feeling that connection with other people. Um, and this is a very important time to be doing that right now. You know, one more thing, the United Way has um, a need for 211 operators. Um, it's something you could do from home. A lot of my clients have asked, how can I help? I want to help. But you can't go anywhere to help. So this is one example of a way you could help getting involved with some organizations um, that do a lot of phone business, like 211 operators. Um, so anyway, you can consider looking for those kinds of opportunities in the community as well. I think that is such, that is such a great idea. And I think that while we, we've talked a little bit about some of the divisive, divisiveness and some of the stress, I think we've also seen the way in which this has brought out the absolute best in so many people. I mean, we have had over a hundred thousand people volunteer to join California's health corps to say, I, you know, I want to be part of the front line in this fight. We have our healthcare workers and our first responders who are on the front line each and every day to keep our community safe. And here in our community, we have people, like you said, we get calls and I know the Congressman does too, every single day for people going, what can I do? How can I help? And those are the conversations that give me so much faith and so much inspiration and so much belief that we, we will get through this. Um, and it's, so in addition to the, the 211 opportunity that you mentioned, um, our local Meals on Wheels programs, they do need drivers. And um, that is a profound profound service to the community and um, we've got I've got some close friends who are doing that and like you said it doesn't just bring joy and bring light to the community it lifts them up each and every time that they do it um, so that's an opportunity and then we are we are also reaching out through my office to seniors um, to check in on the seniors in our community just to see are you okay is there are there issues? Is there anything we can help with? And again, people are so grateful. And the people that are doing that, the people that are volunteering their time feel incredibly gratified. Um, 
So Congressman Ruda, this first question for you. So, you know, tips in terms of how we can, how we can participate in the community. Great question. And you know, we are all cooped up. We're, we're anxious to get out and about uh, while still being under stay at home orders, but there are exceptions to that to uh, do volunteer work. And, uh, you know, for Cadi, for you and I, you know, we're in a business of service and we work with our constituents. We meet with our constituents. We try to pass legislation on their behalf. Uh, but a lot of that work also includes being with them. And it's difficult during these times for us not to be able to uh, be with the ones that we uh, want to serve. And so for me, the, the, the opportunities have been uh, assembling PPE, uh, personal protection equipment that we were able to pull together over 30,000 pieces and deliver it to local hospitals and, and see the frontline healthcare workers receive that. I uh, had the chance uh, earlier this week to deliver meals directly to Laguna Beach's firefighters who are on the front lines every day. And uh, most weekends, I try to get out usually with some family members uh, to local food bank drives where we pass out food to uh, those who need it. And you know, unfortunately, it's about six to 8,000 cars that pass through uh, where I was. And there's other lines uh, in other places that are doing similar work. Uh, but it's, it feels good to get out and help folks in this time of need. And uh, for many, and you, you hit a really good point, Cotty, uh, and we talked about this a little bit, if, if you're feeling down, one of the best ways to feel better is to help others. And we've had a lot of our volunteers who can't be knocking on doors and canvassing right now, just calling uh, senior citizens and saying, hey, are you okay? Do you need anything? Do you need groceries? Do you need errands? Do you need prescriptions filled? You just need someone to talk to. And uh, that's what's amazing right now with this pandemic is that uh, this is an opportunity for all of us to serve, all of us to give back. And uh, I would suggest uh, for everyone that uh, is looking for ways to be re-engaged, that's a great way to do it. Thanks, Scotty, for putting this together. And uh, doctors, thanks for being on. It was, it's a pleasure hearing so much of your information. And I'll turn it back over to the next person. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Congressman Ruda. And before we wrap up, um, there is one question that we've been we've gotten a lot, which is just you know, we, we've talked kind of big picture, we've provided some great resources, but I'd love to hear from, from the three of you and then I'll share as well, kind of what are your, uh, what are your kind of the top things that you do to um, ensure that you're managing stress and managing anxiety? I will start with, let, let me start, at, at Dr. Agar, let me start with you. Um, well, it's something that I, I talked about earlier, you know, I want to make sure that I am waking up at a certain time and, and I start my day in a positive, positive mood and with positive thoughts, you know, that this is going to be a great day. And um, I, I have a gratitude journal and I write down what I'm grateful for. And, and then I go about my day and because we can't go to the gym anymore, I try to, you know, watch something on the internet where I'm, you know, doing Zumba or something where, you know, I'm kind of exercising and getting going. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting my in, the endorphins and making sure that, you know, I, I'm in a positive mood and I'm, I'm going through my day um, in, with that positive mindset. And, and then I, I just want to focus on what can I do? How can I manage my own stress? And then how can I also help others manage their stress as well? Thank you. Dr. Inkleton. Um, thank you for asking. Um, I think part of what I'm doing, I love my job. And so the more people I can help, I feel so much better. It's a little, I feel a little helpless during this situation because so many people need uh, help and I can't reach them all. But I also at home, I practice mindfulness regularly. And also my family's kind of funny. Um, we're all doing shoulder massages. We're just, you know, sharing. Yeah. It's kind of a fun giggly time where, you know, you've got my daughter's grown up, but you know, it's, we have a fun time just cuddling on the couch and just doing shoulder massages and watching a movie or um, I'm also actively involved in uh, several uh, nice uh, professional organizations. So I'm continuing to build new relationships with people, even if it's just meeting on over a zoom meeting um, or in a, you know, in a big group uh, on, on zoom. And the last thing is just spending time doing silly things like doing a puzzle or 
playing with, you know, paints and things like that. Um, I think that's just kind of fun. Well, thank you. And Congressman Ruda, what are, what are your, uh, what are your top tips? Well, my wife and I were empty nesters. We have four kids in their 20s who have all moved back into uh, our, our uh, Fort Ruta quarantine quarters. And uh, interesting, it's, it's actually reduced the stress. I think all of us being together, not on vacation, but here in a common cause to help flatten the curve. We've, we've started a victory garden. Uh, we have dinner together um, every night. And the dinners, interestingly, tend to run you know, an hour or two hours because we're just sitting around talking and laughing and, and uh, having fun together. And these are moments that, uh, candidly, I don't think we would be having right now at this point in our life, but for the pandemic. So we're, we're trying to see the blessings that are coming out of the situation and embrace those best we can and, uh, and work together as we get through it. I'm, I, I think my, my wife and I are going to be sad when, uh, when the kids venture out and go back to uh, the new normal. Well, I think for me, I think so many of you talked about just being being grateful for for all of the blessings that we have. And for me, that's that is my number one. And I think that this has made me very grateful for the little things, whether that's hugging my kids or being able to take my dog for a walk on the beach or um, just being outside and you know feeling the wind in my hair, right? And I. I think it's always important to be really intentional about gratitude um, and not take things for granted. And I think that this moment has really just reinforced that for me. Um, the second thing, and I already talked about that, is I just really limit my information flow on social media. And my third is, I guess, kind of a riff on, on the serenity prayer in terms of like controlling what I can control and doing everything that I can do to flatten this curve, to stay at home, to stay safe, and also to help my community in this moment of crisis. Um, and to also recognize that I cannot control everything and to still be able to, to sleep well at night knowing that. Um, and then I think from a, a you know, broader public policy perspective, I, uh, I am part of the legislature's mental health caucus. Um, so this has been a, a prior, priority and an area of focus for me for some time. And um, I think that as we move through this COVID response and into recovery, so many of our priorities are going to be even more important. Um, we need to dramatically improve California's system for, for mental health care. Uh, we need to treat mental health with the same degree of seriousness that we treat physical health. And we need to to really internalize the lesson that early intervention and prevention is so, so much better than, uh, than waiting for a moment of crisis. Um, so that from a policy perspective will continue to be an area of focus. The legislature just actually returned uh, to session this week. So I was in Sacramento this week and um, we will be continued, continuing to focus on COVID response and, uh, and recovery as we navigate this crisis. So thank you to all of you for joining me tonight. Thank you for all that you do for our community and uh, thank you for your partnership in this. Everyone at home, stay home, stay safe and stay strong.